Trinda's just been talking about what you say, might say to people about the same-sex marriage debate. I've got a different question, and uh, this is my question. What do you say to someone who is going through tough times? Uh, what do you say some, to someone who's going through tough times to encourage them uh, and to inspire them to hang in there? Um, often as Australians, we might say, oh, she'll be right, mate. Don't worry about it. Uh, keep your chin up. You know, every cloud has a silver lining. Some of those sorts of throwaway lines that you might say. Uh, but are there better things that you can say? Or are there worse things that you can say? Maybe you could say, well, I'm sure it's not as bad as you think it is. You know, you'll get through. Uh, and uh, you might even take a teaspoon of cement and harden up. Yeah, I've heard that one. <laughs> I'm sure Kim wouldn't say that. No. Um, or is it just like Bobby McFerrin said, don't worry, be happy? You know, like is it, what can we say to people genuinely to help them when they're going through tough times, when they're facing painful trials. Because when you're going through difficult times, it's good to have something, it's good to offer people something that they can fix their eyes on, that they can focus on to help them to get through. Um, in 2008, um, Tim, can you click for me? In 2008, there was uh, an Australian uh, journalist, Nigel Brennan, and um, a Canadian journalist, Amanda Lindhout, they were taken hostage uh, in Somalia, by Somalian rebels in Mogadishu. And uh, they were taken hostage and, and demanded uh, a large amount of money, millions of dollars for their release. And uh, they spent 15 months in captivity uh, to these hostage takers before they were finally released. But they spent that 15 months sitting on a floor in the corner of a room and occasionally being tortured. Now, I don't know if you can imagine that. I can't get my head around that. Fifteen months sitting in a room on the floor and knowing that uh, every couple of days you're going to be, every week or so, you're going to be tortured. How do you keep positive? How do you keep your eyes fixed on hope for the future in that situation? Um, Amanda Lindhout said that she tried to keep going by thinking of her home in Canada. That was the vision that she had that kept her going. And she said these words, I think human beings have an enormous capacity to adjust to trying circumstances. And it was the idea of coming home, of a reunion with my family, that kept me going in that darkness. I would just try to escape in my mind to a sunny place, usually Vancouver. I'd imagine running around in Stanley Park. What would you focus on in a situation like that? What, and what, or what would you say to someone who was facing difficult times and trials and pain and persecution, what would you say to inspire them to hang in there? Well, we're looking at uh, 1 Peter over the next um, six, six weeks uh, from today. And um, the book of 1 Peter is written uh, to encourage Christians who are going through, uh, going through trials and uh, who need to hang in there. And we need to know who it's written by and who it's written to. So that's the first thing we're going to look at today. If you have a look at, um, at uh, the first verse there, you'll see it's written, tells us who it's written by, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. It's, uh, we know Peter, don't we, the disciple, uh, the one who uh, was very bold but also didn't know when to keep his mouth shut. Um, he betrayed Jesus three times, you remember, but he was also forgiven by Jesus three times. But he describes him here, himself here as an apostle of Jesus Christ, someone who's sent, someone who's commissioned to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to spread that throughout the world. So that's who, who wrote it, but who is he writing to? You see the first words there in, in the, the next paragraph. He says, to God's elect. What's an elect person? Someone who's chosen, isn't it? If you, if you elect a politician, you choose the politicians uh, that, you, that you're going to um, put into place. An, an elect person is someone who's chosen because we know that God saves sinners. Sinners don't save themselves. That's true, isn't it? It's only God that saves sinners. Sinners can't save themselves. And you notice that down in verse 2, uh, he, he says it again, uh, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God chooses us. We're too blind in our natural state as human beings to choose God. We're too blinded by the things of this world to choose God. God chooses us 
and he reveals himself to us. And, and then it goes on to say, after that, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, he reveals himself to us and helps us to become his people, his holy people, sanctified. And Because sinners don't sanctify themselves. It's God who sanctifies sinners. And why were they chosen? He goes on to say, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Obedience to Jesus, that's God's purpose for you. People sometimes say to me, oh, I wish I knew what God's purpose for me was in life. Yeah, what does God want me to do? Well, it's here. Very simply, you were chosen by God for obedience to Jesus. That's why you're here, to obey Jesus in all you do. But also, you notice, by, and you were chosen for sprinkling by his blood. Now, what does that refer to? It sounds a bit creepy, doesn't it, being sprinkled with blood? But remember, it refers back to the Old Testament where they would take the sacrifice, uh, the, the um, blood of the sacrifice, and sprinkle it on the altar. And that was the uh, sign of atonement, that peace had been made uh, between man and God through the blood of the sacrifice. And we know that the blood of Jesus makes peace between man and God. That's why you've been chosen, so that you can live at peace with God. So that's the first thing he says about who he's writing to. It's to God's elect. But notice also how he um, describes them in the next words. After God's elect, he says, strangers in the world. Now, that's an interesting word, this, this word strangers. Uh, in, in the Greek language, it, it has a, a few different ideas. It could mean the word uh, exiles. But what, it mean, what it's referring to is someone who's like a traveler, someone who's passing through somewhere. Uh, they're, they're temporary residents, temporary citizens of that place. They don't belong there. They're passing through. It's got the idea of being displaced from your homeland. This land is not my home. And But also has the idea of being persecuted or marginalised by the society that you live in. In other words, other people saying, you don't belong here. We don't want you here. So think about that. He's writing to people who are temporary residents where they live, who are made to feel that they are temporary residents, that you don't belong here. And your next, uh, there's uh, another word there. He says, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And the idea of being scattered, if you look in the Old Testament, it's talking about those who were exiled uh, when Israel was unfaithful to God, they were taken into exile. And so they were Jewish people living away from their homeland, away from Jerusalem, and living in a foreign land. They'd been scattered into those other lands. But in the New Testament, the idea of being scattered refers to Christians who are exiles. Firstly, it's to Peter's readers, but also to us. Because our homeland is God's kingdom. Where do you live? Well, you live here in Narrabri. You live in Australia. But your homeland is not here. It's God's kingdom. This world is just where we live for 70, 80, 90 years. But we don't belong here. You might like living in Australia. You might love living in Australia, and I do. But your primary citizenship is not in Australia. Your primary citizenship is in heaven. You might love living in Narrabri. But Narrabri is not your eternal home. Your your address after you die is not Camilleroy Highway, Narrabri, the Lawn Cemetery. Your address is God's kingdom. That's your home because that's where you will be for eternity. You're living in exile here. You are strangers to this world because you belong to another place, another homeland. So don't get too comfortable here because this place is not your home. I said um, a while ago uh, at um, clergy conference, this, uh, I, I was gripped by this um, interesting quote uh, and it's stuck in my head. It says, the more tightly you grip onto God's kingdom, the more loosely 
you hold on to the things of this world. And the opposite of that is true. The more tightly you grip onto the things of this world, the more loosely you hold to God's kingdom. That's true, isn't it? Have you ever noticed how how um, kids and adults think differently about sandcastles? For kids, sandcastles are there to be jumped on and destroyed. Kids know that sandcastles are temporary. They, they want to jump, they want the waves to come in and wash the sand away and for the sandcastles to collapse because it's exciting. And they know that sandcastles are temporary. If you're an adult though, uh, sandcastles are not meant to be temporary. If you're an adult, you take a lot of time building your sandcastle. And uh, you create a sandcastle that is going to last for a long time and you won't let the kids go near your sandcastle just in case they accidentally knock it over. And you build a, a wall around your sandcastle to protect it from the incoming waves and you build a moat so that any water that comes in drains away and it doesn't undermine the foundations of your sandcastle. You ever noticed how kids and adults think differently about sandcastles? Kids know that sandcastles are temporary. They're looking for other adventures, other fun. This world is not your permanent home. This world is temporary. Your real home, your eternal home, is God's kingdom. We don't belong here. It becomes evident at different times, doesn't it? It's become evident in some ways in this debate about uh, same-sex marriage, uh, that we're being told that there's no place in society for those who want to vote no. You're just getting in the way. Step aside. You don't belong here. We don't want you here. We don't belong here because this world is not our home. We're just passing through. So Peter's writing to people who are strangers, who are exiles, who are scattered throughout all these different areas, but also people who've been chosen by God for a purpose. What's he going to, uh, what's he going to say to encourage and inspire these people uh, when they are Christians, they're living like exiles and strangers in a foreign land? Well, firstly, he reminds them of the great hope that they have for the future. Let's look at verses 3. Uh, and 4 and 5. Verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Can you hear the excitement in his voice? Peter's excited about this truth, isn't he? Because there are so many reasons to praise God. He's saying, you might be exiles and strangers in this world, but, but look at what God has done. God has, by his great mercy, given us new birth. He has rescued us from the life of sin and death, and he has given us a new life to live here that will last into eternity. He has saved us for eternity. But this new birth brings us into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have hope for life beyond death in God's kingdom and that rests completely on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then it's all a load of bull. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we have no hope. But God has given us new birth into a living hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. But not just into a living hope. Uh, look what also in verse 4. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. This is more than just inheriting your parents' wealth. And I know you're all looking forward to that, inheriting your parents' wealth. But this is an inheritance that is far greater far more permanent and secure. It will never perish or spoil or fade. And it's inheritance that's waiting for us in heaven, kept by God for you. 
And you, in the meantime, being protected by God's power through faith for a salvation that is going to be revealed in the last time. Our salvation is waiting for us and it will be revealed completely and fully to us when we get to see God in heaven. These are great reasons to have a hope for the future, aren't they? No matter what life may throw at you now. But look, it goes on, verses 6 and 7, more reasons. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. How can you have joy in the face of difficulties and, in, and trials and opposition to your faith? How can you have joy in those times? Because you know there's a purpose to all these trials. You know that, there's a, that your faith is being proved genuine, that people will praise and honour and glorify Jesus because of your faith. That's a great reason, isn't it, to stay strong through trials. Why do women go through childbirth? I have no idea. It just seems like too much hard work, too much pain. It's even life-threatening, isn't it, to go through childbirth? Why do women go through childbirth? (laughs) Why? Because of the great reward that waits for them at the end of the process. A new life, a baby to hold and to care for. That's the hope that drives women through childbirth, that drives them to endure the painful trial. And Peter's saying to these Christians, you're going through painful trials now. You're being made to feel like you're strangers and exiles in this world, and you are because you don't belong here. But keep your eyes fixed on the sure hope of God's kingdom and the certain inheritance that is waiting there for you. You Now they often say Christianity is just all about some future, vague hope for the future. Now Christianity, have you heard this phrase? Christianity is about pie in the sky when you die. Okay? I had a mate who used to say Christianity is not about pie in the sky when you die. Christianity is about steak on your plate while you wait. That's a good one, isn't it? Because there's more to Christianity than just a hope for the future. And that's what Peter goes on to say, that this great joy that they have is in this life as well. Look at verses 8 and 9. Uh, yeah, eight and nine. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith the salvation of your souls. It's interesting, In verse, back in verse 5, you look at the end of verse 5 and he talks about the salvation that will be revealed in the last time, a salvation that we will finally see when we get to heaven. But here, you notice what the, when the salvation comes? You are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That great inheritance that we have that will happen in the future, you get that now. You get it right now. You have that certain knowledge of your salvation. You're experiencing the great love of Jesus, the mercy of God, the grace of your God in your life right now. Imagine you stand to inherit a million dollars. Just just imagine, okay? Uh, you know, you've got a very wealthy benefactor and they say, when I kick the bucket, uh, you're going you're gonna to inherit a million dollars. The only problem with that is you've got to wait till they kick the bucket, okay? But you look forward to it. It's a, it's, a, it's a big goal. It's an inheritance that you're waiting for. A million bucks, imagine that. Imagine all the things I could do with a million bucks. What am I going to do when I get that million bucks? And you look forward to it, and it gives you a lot of joy looking forward to it, but you've got to wait. But imagine if that benefactor said, look, I've got a million bucks for you as an inheritance, but I want to see you spend it. I want you to enjoy it now while I'm still here to see it. Start spending it now. Start spending it now, and then when I die, I'll guarantee there's still a million dollars there for you. Can you imagine that? Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But that's what we have as Christians. That's the reality for us 
as Christians, we have this great inheritance that's waiting for us, but we get to experience it now. And that doesn't lessen what's going to, doesn't make it any less what we're going to experience when we go to be in heaven with God, when we go to God's kingdom. We will still have this great inheritance, but we get to see it now. We get to know it now because, as he's just said, even though you don't see Jesus, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy because you know your salvation. This is great reason for celebration. And we know that joy is far deeper than happiness. People often say, I just want to be happy in life. Or I just want my kids to grow up to be happy. Happy's good, but happiness fades. Joy lasts. And joy can endure trials and difficulties like happiness can't. We have this great salvation that is waiting for us, but we experience this great salvation now. And it's the nowness of this. It's in the here and now that's important. Look, look at verses 10 uh, to 12. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. See, Peter's saying it's happening now. All this that, that has been anticipated for many years by all the prophets, you are getting it right now as you are receiving the salvation of your souls now. It's here, and you're experiencing the joy of it right now. You see how Peter tries to encourage and inspire these Christians who are living like exiles and strangers in the world, who are going through all sorts of grief and trials, as he's mentioned already. See how he tries to encourage them? He creates a great picture of the future hope that we have, but then he shows them how they're experiencing that future salvation right now. We have so many great reasons to trust God for the future. What keeps you going? These words are written for us to learn from, aren't they? We don't belong here. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on our eternal home. We need to keep our hope fixed on God's kingdom. But we can, and we can rejoice in the great salvation that is waiting for us because we're receiving it right now. Now, how's all this going to change the way you live? That's what the rest of 1 Peter's about. And next week, uh, from next week, we're going to start seeing how Peter says, now that you know this, this is what you've got to do. So read ahead. Uh, don't wait for next week. Read the rest of 1 Peter today. Uh, read it through a few times before next week and you'll start to see how this great hope that we have, it will change our lives. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for uh, the great hope that you have given us in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we know that through his resurrection from the dead, we have a sure and certain hope of salvation waiting for us in your kingdom an inheritance that will never perish or spoil or fade. Father God, we thank you uh, that we look forward to this salvation, but we also thank you that we get to experience it right now, that you've poured out your love and your mercy into our lives, that we know Jesus, even though we haven't seen him, we know him and we love him and we believe in him. Father, I pray that you would help us when we face difficulties, when we face opposition for being Christians, when we face trials, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, fixed on the future hope that we have. And Lord, please inspire us and encourage us to live for you every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.